Okay, so um, we, we have been talking for the past several weeks about forces, and, uh, and before that we were talking about kinematics. And what I want to emphasize is that uh, when you think about um, forces and Newton's laws, it really all comes back to this. This equation right here is Newton's second law. And Newton's second law is one of the most important discoveries in physics, one of the most important discoveries in science. And everything we've done, including the stuff we did in kinematics, is really tied into this. So when we were talking about forces, we started by going through Newton's laws. And Newton's first law says it takes an overall force to cause an object to accelerate. If something is motionless, it's not going to be experiencing an overall force if it stays motionless. If it's moving, but it's moving at a constant velocity, no overall force. There might be individual forces, but there's no overall force on the object. But if you see an object accelerating, then there has to be an overall force on it. There has to be at least one force, and any forces that are there can't just sort of balance each other out. Right? That's Newton's first law. Newton's second law is this. Mathematically, what this says is acceleration will increase if the overall force on an object increases. Acceleration will decrease if we have the same overall force on objects with larger masses. The acceleration of an object will be directly proportional to the overall force. The greater the overall force, the greater the acceleration. And it's inversely proportional to the mass of the object being accelerated. If you were pushing something with an overall force of 10 newtons and it magically gained mass, you would find that it accelerated more and more slowly. It's harder to accelerate objects with more mass. All right? And Newton's second law mathematically also says something that's not super obvious. If, if we were to be really precise here, we would add the little vector symbol over force and acceleration because these are both vector quantities. Since the sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration, the direction of the overall force will also be equal to the direction of the acceleration. So we've got not just magnitude, but direction involved with Newton's second law. Okay. Newton's third law, it was more to help us kind of figure out what forces are acting on things. Newton's third law says that forces always come in pairs. You don't just have object A pushing on object B. If that's happening, then object B will be pushing back on object A at the exact same time with the exact same force in the exact opposite direction. That is always true. You name a force, and I will tell you there's going to be another force, same size, that occurs at the exact same time in the opposite direction. Those forces come into being at the same time, they disappear at the same time. They always act on the same two objects. So um, that's helpful because it can, it, it, if we think about forces as single things, like if we think about like, well, I'm going to push on this board right now, and I'm pushing on the board and that's it, then explain how me pushing on the board is causing my body to accelerate this way. That doesn't make any sense. If I'm pushing on the board, the board should move, maybe accelerate, but why am I accelerating? And the answer is because if I push on the board, it pushes back on me. So those third law forces, sometimes they're super obvious and sometimes they're not, but they're generally really helpful to us in explaining the, the overall forces on an object. They're, they're, they, they are uh, forces that are sometimes a little hidden. And then as you start using Newton's third law more and more, you realize, oh, okay, there's a force there. That force sensor is pushing up on the weight because the weight is pushing down on the force sensor. The pole of the ring stand is pushing up on the clamp, and the clamp is pushing down on the ring stand. All of those forces are happening at the same time. When you push the gas pedal in your car, it's not that the car goes forward. The gas pedal pushes back on your foot. You can feel it pushing back on you. Okay, so that's Newton's third law. And then we talked a little bit about, um, about friction. And um, we kind of looked at friction in a, a few different stages. We looked at friction it just as like, well, it's just a force. Let's figure out how big it is. So we had a cart that was sliding along a track 
called pushing a block. And we did some measurements, and that was the first time we used Newton's second law. Because what I said was, look, if, it's, if we get this thing moving at a constant speed, then there's no acceleration. That means there's no overall force. And if we set this up so that there's only two forces, one in one direction, one in the other direction, and we know it's not accelerating, then those two forces have to be the same. And that's how we found the force of friction acting on it. We were like, well, it's not accelerating. It's being pulled by this force that we can measure with a force sensor. Therefore, it must be being pulled by friction with the same force in the opposite direction. So we were using Newton's second law there, but in a really simple, like, just sort of intuitive way. Um, and then we looked at the idea that that kind of friction, which is friction acting on a moving object, is a little bit different than the kind of friction that acts on objects that are motionless. Kinetic friction, you always know what direction it is, because it's in the opposite direction the object is moving. And it always has the same size. If something is moving, sliding along a surface, and it experiences a force of 1.5 newtons, you can move it faster, you can pull it with more force, you can do whatever. As long as it's moving, it will experience that same size of force. But static friction was different. Static friction, we couldn't see it, because the object isn't moving. So you sort of have to infer, well, if static friction weren't there, what would happen? And sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes it's obvious. If you have an object on a ramp and it's sitting there, then you know well, friction is in the opposite of the direction of the ramp, because things will go down ramps. But if, for example, you are um, pushing up on an object that's on a flat surface like this, it's a little bit harder to know which direction friction is. Because if I suddenly turn friction off, if this thing were mounted on ball bearings, it's possible that I'm pushing hard enough that it would start to move up. It's also possible that I'm not pushing hard enough to even keep it in place and it would start to slide down. It's also possible that I'm pushing with just enough force to keep it here. We don't know. You, we, we can't tell just by looking. And, um, and so we, we would have to employ some other things to be able to determine what was going on there. And, um, and, so, and then we talked about how friction only depends on the stickiness between things, which we quantify with a ratio that we call mu, and the amount of force that screws two things together, which is the normal force. So we're just like adding all this stuff. We had Newton's three laws, then we had static or kinetic friction, then static friction, then the model of friction, which tells us that any kind of friction is equal to mu times the normal force. And then we were like, okay, well wait, what about the normal force? So we looked at that, and we were looking at the normal force, and thinking about an object's weight, and thinking about the angle of things that we're using to measure the weight of an object, and it was really starting to get kind of, kind of like there was a lot going on. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take all of that and tuck it back into this. Because this is really what's most important. Now that we know that friction is a force, now that we know that the normal force is a force, we can work with them in the context of Newton's second law. So, um, and the, the key to doing that is going to be to be able to apply a general system that we'll call the process, right? And so the process involves drawing free body diagrams, which can be super easy or can be really complicated. And then thinking about friction, which again can be pretty easy or really complicated. And then once we've got free body diagrams, figured out how friction plays into a particular scenario, then we start using Newton's second law to find unknowns. And the kinds of unknowns that we might find might have to do with friction, or mu, or the normal force. There's a bunch of different ways to find those things. Not only that, but we have a connection here with kinematics. So with kinematics, we looked at objects moving and thinking about their displacement, where they are, how far they've moved, and in what direction, how fast they're going, how quickly their speed or direction changing. We looked at all of those things, and then we kind of we narrowed our focus and said, okay, well, what if something is accelerating at a constant rate? If we have constant acceleration, we ended up with some equations that are valid under that condition. And those equations will be valid when acceleration is constant. Acceleration will be constant when the overall force on an object is constant. 
So if we have a situation in which there are a constant set of forces acting on an object, then it will have constant acceleration. And we can use our kinematic equations. So that ultimately is where we're going to go. We're, we're tying everything together, and it's going to start today. And I will warn you that um, and you, you by now have experienced this. Okay, so j just be aware, it's going to happen again. When I do something like this, some of you are not only going to follow along with complete understanding, some of you are already going to know it. Like this is, you, you know this stuff, and that's, that's great. Most of you aren't going to know it already. But some of you are going to, as I do this, you're going to be like, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. And then when I'm done, you'll be able to do it. Like, you will be there. You will have this master. You'll be able to use Newton's second law to take anything apart, put anything back together that you want to get any unknowns, any predictions. You'll be able to do it. But most of you won't. Most of you will watch what I do and either get it but need more practice or you won't get it yet. And don't panic if that's you. If I do this and you're like, uh, what? That's OK. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks practicing. We're going to work in little pieces. We're going to have homework. We're going to have a, a couple different lab activities that we do. And the whole idea is to give you some time to practice what I'm about to show you, because it gets really complex really quickly. All right, so, um, so with that in mind, can you do this? Yes. Um, so with that in mind, let me remind you of what we determined about Newton's second law when, um, when uh, we're in the condition of equilibrium. Okay? And what we discovered is that um, this equation, Newton's second law, involves vectors. It's not just adding numbers together, it's adding vectors together that have direction as well. But what we realized is, well, we, we, we know that this is going to be true. And if we constrain our situation, in such a way that, um, that we're, we're looking at a small number of forces that are all along the same axis, we can, we can make some decent predictions. Okay? One of the things that's important here is to recognize that, um, that when we talk about mass, that isn't the same thing as weight. Mass is the amount of stuff in an object. And this is a little tricky because um, we, outside of physics, use mass and weight interchangeably. It just doesn't matter which one we use. If, in fact, if you've ever traveled internationally, many countries will, will sell stuff in a grocery store by mass, by a couple kilograms of apples. Here in the United States, we sell apples by pounds. If you want to know how, much, how big somebody is in the United States, they'll tell you their weight in pounds. Outside of the US, they tell you the mass in kilograms. They could tell you the weight in newtons, too. It's not the same number, but it's proportional. Because weight is a force. It's the size of the force with which the Earth is pulling down on something. And when we're close to the surface of the Earth, everything will accelerate at the same rate. Objects with larger mass have proportionally larger weight as well. So it all ends up sort of being, outside of physics, the same. But inside of physics, these two things are really different. Matter is the amount of stuff in an object. Weight is the size of the downward force acting on an object. Sometimes in physics, things are dependent on an object's mass. Sometimes they're dependent on an object's weight. We have to sort that out. That will be a, a, something, it'll take a little while for us to get to. We'll bring it up, I'll bring it up repeatedly, you'll bring it up, you'll be asking me questions, wait, do we use kilograms or newtons here? How do we know if this, how do we know if M is in kilograms or in newtons? Like we'll talk, you'll ask questions like that and we'll talk about it over and over until everybody is like at a point where you feel pretty good about the difference between mass and weight, when you need to use an object's mass, and when you need to know its weight. Um, and then what we said was, okay, if we have an object that isn't moving, or it's moving at a constant velocity, then the acceleration is zero. And if you multiply whatever the object's mass is by zero, you get zero, which means objects that aren't accelerating have no overall force. The sum of forces is zero. And then we said, oh, I know. If we have objects that are experiencing pretty straightforward forces, we can kind of figure them out. Like, if we have an object that's at rest, 
on a table like this, then the downward force from the Earth's gravity and the upward normal force from the table are going to be the same. So if I can figure out one of them, I can figure the other. And if somebody is pushing one way on this box, but is not accelerating, not moving maybe, then friction in the opposite direction has to be balancing out that pushing force. So if we can measure that pushing force with a you know, force sensor or something, then we can use that to figure out what the force of friction has to be. Simple, intuitive, two forces in opposite directions. If they're canceling each other out, we'll know because the object won't be accelerating. And when that's the case, we can figure out one sometimes, and then we can use that to compute the other. That's what we did when we found the force of friction acting on the cart as it pushed a block. We had a force sensor hooked up to it. We pulled on the force sensor, so we knew how much force was being applied to the cart in one direction, and then we engineered a situation that had the cart moving at a constant rate, no acceleration. So that meant the friction in the opposite direction had to be the same. So if we knew we were pulling with a force of 1.5 newtons, we knew friction had to be pulling in the opposite direction with the exact same force. There was no other way for it to not be accelerating. And that was great, but of course, sometimes things accelerate. And so um, when we think about acceleration, um, now both sides of that equation are going to be non-zero. If an acceleration is not zero, then mass times acceleration will be zero, which means there will be an overall force on the object. We call that condition dynamics. Statics is when there's no overall force. Dynamics is when there is an overall force and therefore acceleration. So we use the same equation. It's just this variable won't be zero anymore. And um, in this, uh, um, as I mentioned before, in this equation, since force and acceleration are both vector quantities, they have a direction associated with them. Since the vector quantity on the left will be equal to the vector quantity on the right, those directions have to be the same as well. So if you look at a situation like this, where if we just look at the horizontal dimension, there is a force to the right that's bigger than the force to the left. That means there's a net force to the right, an overall force to the right. This object is accelerating to the right. We know that. What's tricky about that is its acceleration. What does acceleration tell us about? An object's speed, how much? Like this object, at the moment that this picture was taken, may have been moving this way. If it's moving this way and accelerating this way, it's slowing down. It also may have been moving this way. If it was moving to the right while it was accelerating to the right, then it would be speeding up. It also, at the moment that I took this screenshot, it might have been motionless, in which case it's going to slowly speed up to the, not, not necessarily slowly, but it's going to start off with no velocity, and then its velocity will increase, it will speed up as it moves to the right. All three of those cases are possible, and that's just looking at the horizontal dimension. In the vertical dimension, this acceleration does not tell us whether or not it's moving or accelerating up or down. For all we know, this, this cart full of whatever is in here was dropped from a very large height. And at the moment of this screenshot, it's resting on the ground. But if we were to see what happened next, it would start going up. Maybe it's bouncing off the ground. If you were to take a video of a basketball, you could find a frame where the basketball looked like it was just sitting still on the ground in mid-bounce. So just because something is on the ground at any one time does not mean it's not moving up or down. It still might be going up or it might be on its way down, right? Like this cart, at right prior to, um, to taking this screenshot, all of this mass might have been dumped into this cart. And for all we know, in the next instant, it fell down. It broke through the track, the ground, and started accelerating downward in that simulation. Does that happen in simulations? I mean, if you're a mechanical engineer, yes, you'll break things in simulations all the time. Does that happen in real life? It sure does. Like, if you are walking across a, um, like, if you're at a construction site, you're walking across a piece of plywood, and you hear that piece of plywood go, <laughs> to get off of it, because you're about to start accelerating downward. 
right? <laughs> it needs to break. Yeah. Okay, um, and then um, because these forces are vectors, we have to use vector mathematics. For today, it's going to be relatively straightforward. Down the road, it's not. Down the road, we're going to have to do a lot of vector solver stuff and trigonometry stuff. We have to. Okay. So this is the kind of the big picture of what Newton's law looks like. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to walk you through what I call the process. Actually, I didn't come up with this. One of my student teachers a couple of years ago did. His name was uh, Nick Peach. He's a great guy. He's hilarious, Mr. Peach. And he was really in basketball, super tall. And so he called it the process because of Joel Lombi. And I'll tell you what that connection is momentarily. This technique is not the only way to figure stuff out. A lot of people do something different. And you are welcome to do something different. But understand two things. The first is, if you do something different and I can't figure out what you've done, then it's like you can have to do it again. I'm not going to like go through and like take off points. That's not how I operate. I'm not going to be like minus half a point because you, you use a capital M and stuff. Well, our case is going to be after it doesn't mean or you don't get more credit. That's not how I roll. But if I look at your work and I'm like, I don't know what they did, then I'm just going to give it back to you and be like, I don't know what you did. And if you follow this process, I will understand. If you go through the steps that I'm about to show you, I will be able to look at your work and follow your reasoning. The other thing to think about for those of you who are in AP physics is that it's not just me who will understand this. Anybody who knows physics will be able to understand this process. So if you use this process, you will have a universal language that anybody will be able to understand. That's why I came up with it. If you don't want to use it, that's fine. If I can figure out what you understand and what you can do, you're both good. I mean, if I can't, then I'm just going to give it back to you and say I couldn't figure out. And, and, it, and I'm not, like, if you're like, well, let me show you what I did. And you're like, no, 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 no. You write it down. And, and so my recommendation is use this. It works. It's so helpful. And here's how it works. So the first thing that you do is, just like with kinematics, make a drawing. And then establish a reference frame. We're going to go through this in an example. In fact, this is the example we're going to do. Okay. So, um, so in this case, um, if we think about like a story problem involving a skier, a skier is going down a slope. The slope is at a 25 degree angle. The skier has a weight of W and, um, and starts at rest and after 10 seconds, how fast is the skier going? And um, there's some assumptions that we might need to make here. Like, like there's no, there's no um, uh, it, it's not impossible that this skier is going to accelerate into the hill or into the air. How could that happen? Well, imagine that this is a helicopter skier. And they drop this skier from a helicopter. Down the skier goes. At the moment they hit the ground, they're going to bounce back up again a little bit, right? Like, it's not a lot, but they'll like hit the ground and then bounce back up. So they could be going up or like up in the mountains today, it's just been snowing and snowing and snowing and snowing. Those of you who are skiers know that like, if you come off the ski lift into fresh powder, you drop down, don't you? Like You don't just stay on the very surface of the powder. You sit down two inches, six inches. Like If it's like, like you 12 inches of powder and down you go. So it's possible that this skier is accelerating into the hill. We don't know. But usually, we can make reasonable assumptions like the skier is going to move in this direction. Okay? And, um, and so those are the kinds of problems that we get. And then we would make a drawing. We draw a skier on a hill. And, and then this is a free body diagram. This is a reference frame. And I'll show you how to do all of that in just a second. The next thing that you do is make a free body diagram. And I say one at a time here because sometimes you'll have more than one object. Or sometimes it'll be the same object in two different environments. So like with our, um, what does the scale say? There were three different free body diagrams for the three different like conditions. One where the scale was pointing straight up, one where it was perfectly horizontal, and one where it was at an angle. Those were all three different free body diagrams that we drew. Um, and so, um, 
When you look at a free body diagram, it shows only one object. And, and if we need to know about more than one object in a problem, then we need to make more than one free body diagram. The next thing that you have to do is look for forces that are not aligned with your reference axis. And then you need to take those forces and use the vector solver or trigonometry to break them into components that are aligned with the reference axes. And I'll show you how to do that. The next step is to apply Newton's second law. And the way Newton's second law works is you can think about it in three dimensions. If I know all of the forces acting on an object three-dimensionally, and I add all those up using fancy vector math, the result will be equal to that object's mass times its acceleration in those same three dimensions. So maybe it's accelerating this way, maybe it's accelerating this way, up, straight down, this, we don't know. It will work. If we want to keep things simple, though, it's easier to use Newton's third law in one dimension at a time, or second law in one dimension at a time. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, along with this axis, what are all the forces and components affecting the object? And what is its resulting acceleration along that line? And then, if we have another dimension, if we're looking at a two-dimensional problem, we'll look at another axis that's at a 90-degree angle of that one and ask the same question. On the rare occasion that we look at three-dimensional problems, we'll do that with the third axis as well. So we're going to use, often, we'll use Newton's second law twice. Once for one dimension, and once at a 90-degree angle to that dimension. And lastly, we find unknowns. And this is where it can get pretty complicated, because in Newton's second law, there's three unknowns right here. Sum of forces mass, acceleration. Each individual force could be an unknown. So if you have three forces acting in a particular dimension, one of those might be unknown. In addition to that, friction has a, a model that describes the magnitude of friction force acting on an object, mu times the normal force. There's a couple more unknowns. In addition to that, this variable here, acceleration, shows up in our kinematic equations which means this could potentially lead to other unknowns like initial velocity or time. We could ask a question like, if we have this situation and it takes the skier 11 seconds to travel 12 meters, what was the skier's initial velocity? We could solve a problem like that by taking Newton's laws, using them in conjunction with kinematics to put everything together. Okay? So this is the process. And the reason that I call it the process is because what's going to happen is um, you'll find that for every single situation involving forces, you're going to do this. Most of the time, it's going to be helpful. Sometimes, like occasionally, you'll do it and you'll be like, oh, I didn't need to do that. But most of the time, it'll be helpful. And here's the weird thing about it is that you're going to be asked questions. You're going to be making predictions that don't obviously fit into this, right? You're going to be asking a question like, um, like, how much mass do I put over here to make this thing accelerate at a certain rate? And you're like, okay, well, I don't see any forces. Like, nobody's told me any forces. I don't know what to do here. But if you start getting used to the idea that any time there's any mention of forces or acceleration, that you think, okay, I'm going to make a drawing, make free body diagrams, I'm going to figure out my force components. I'm going to apply new the second law, and I'm going to see if I can figure out any unknowns. You will find that you can crack the kinds of problems and make the kinds of predictions that you need to make, whether it's in regular physics or AP physics. If you don't do that, then you're going to be constantly coming to me and saying, how do I find this? What's the equation for initial velocity? How do I find mass? Like, What's the equation for mass? I don't know the weight. So how am I supposed to find mass if I don't know the weight? And the answer is going to be start here and work your way down. This is a process that gets you useful information, and it works every time. So that's where Joel Embiid comes in, because those of you who are basketball fans may know that several years ago, the 76ers drafted this monster of a basketball player, and then they sucked. And they sucked because he kept getting injured. 
and there weren't any other good players on the team. And fans of the Philadelphia 76ers were like, this is horrible, you've ruined everything, you drafted this guy, and now he can't even play, and we're not good, we're losing all the games. And the management for the 76ers, do you know, you, you probably know this, right? Do you know this story about Joe Lombie? They kept saying, trust the process. And then um, Pete himself started referring to himself as the process, and that's his nickname now. This man has a nickname, and that nickname is the process. And here's what happened is part of the process was to um, make him more injury proof, right? They like worked on his physical body, weightlifting and strength training and all this stuff, and they did it all. And by gum, he's like much less injury prone now. Like five years ago, he never played. Now he is a regular starter. And because they lost so many games, they were able to draft good players. And they pulled a bunch of good players in from college. And now they're a really good team. Like they potentially can win a championship. Like year after year, now for the last several years, they're like right there. So that's the process. People were like, I don't see how this is going to get us to victory. That's how you get to victory. This is how you solve problems involving forces in physics. So let me walk you through this. So um, let's start with this. And what I want you to do is just pretend that this picture doesn't exist. Let's pretend instead that it's a story problem. Okay? And by looking at the picture, we can kind of figure the story problem. Let's, let's say we have a skier on a slope. The skier is sliding down the slope that is at some angle. Um, there's some friction, not a lot because you're skiing, but there's some. And, um, and now we maybe have a question. Like, uh, if, it, if the skier starts at rest and moves for 11 seconds, how fast will the skier be going uh, you know, after that 11 seconds? So here's how you would solve a problem like that. The first thing you do is you draw a picture. And interestingly enough, I never draw my ramps like this. I always draw them the other way. So let's forget about this. Let's pretend that this, this is, let's pretend that this was words that define this story problem. And instead, let's draw it the way I would. I would draw it like this. This is my ski ramp, right? And it's got an angle here. Let's say we don't know it, okay? So here's the ground. And then I've got my skier up here, and you better believe this is how I draw my skiers, because that's how I draw all my people. And we know this person is moving down the ski hill, and that's basically all we know. So there's my drawing. That's part of step one. The next part of step one is to, um, to establish a reference set of axes. So here's how you do that. The first thing is you've got to figure out what directions should they be in. And theoretically, we can pick any direction. Like I could use this set, or this, or this, or this, or this. Anything will work. But there's often one set of axes that's going to be easiest. And I'll give you lots of tips for how to figure it out. But the two most important ones are try to make one of your axes match up with the direction of any motion in the problem. So if we have something moving in a straight line like this, let's have one of our axes in that same direction. And that means the other one's going to be perpendicular to it. So that's a pretty good set of axes to use because we're, our motion is in this direction. Another reason to choose this is because we are going to have some forces that line up with those axes too. right? Because there's going to be a friction force, which is opposite the direction of motion, and a normal force, which is going to be perpendicular to the hill. So there's there's some good reasons to pick these axes. I'm going to call this one that's more horizontal my x-axis. I'm going to call this one my y-axis. You do not need to put little plus signs if you draw your axis like this. If you draw both arrows, I don't know which direction is positive. If you only draw half an arrow for each, then this is positive and this is positive. That, that, that by default, you don't need to add the little plus sign. If I see this, I know what direction your axes are, and along each axis, I know which direction is positive. This direction is positive y, this direction is negative y. This direction is positive x, this direction is negative x. Okay, so we're good. 
The next thing, let's see if I can get this to work. Ah. Ah. The next thing that we want to do is make a free body diagram. So let's make a free body diagram. And in this case, right, you have a whole bunch of objects here. There's a hat. There's the snow on the hill, the skis, the pole, the boots. But much of the time, it's going to be pretty obvious. And in this case, it's pretty obvious that the, the thing we really care about is the skier. So let's just draw one free body diagram for the skier and hope that that's good enough. What are the forces acting on the skier? Well, there's a gravitational force pulling straight down on the skier. And the skier, we're not told what the skier's mass is. So let's just call it m. That's typically what I'm going to do. And I like to label my objects with the mass. Because if we have objects, multiple objects in a problem, oftentimes they're going to be distinguished by mass. You have a 5 kilogram weight, and it bumps into a 3 kilogram weight or something. There's a cart with a mass of 11 kilograms, and it's um, you know rolling down a hill being pulled by somebody with a mass of 6 kilograms or whatever. You'll have masses, usually. So I like to label my objects with that mass. So that means the magnitude of this downward force, which is the force of gravity acting on the skier, is going to be m times g. The skier's mass times that constant g, which is 10 meters per second squared. We also have a normal force from the ski hill itself. The ski hill is like a surface pushing up perpendicularly to that surface. And then there is a friction force that's acting in the opposite direction of the skier's motion. Those are the three forces acting on this object. So there's my free body diagram. If we had more objects, or if this object were like in different configurations, we might need to make some more free body diagrams. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at our forces and break any forces that aren't lined up with either of our axes into components. So this is one of the things that's going to take some practice because when we think about this, like most of you are looking at this and being like, well, that's in the negative direction because down is negative, but it's not. Down is down. If you define down as being negative along a particular axis, then yes, any forces that are down will have a negative sign in front of them. But there's no such thing as a negative force. But there's only positive forces. They can be in the negative direction if you have a one-dimensional axis and you define one of those directions as positive and the other as negative. So in this case, we can look at our normal force and it's along our y-axis, and it's in the positive direction. We can look at our friction force. It's along the x-axis, and it's in the negative direction. And then when we look at the gravitational force, mg, it is down. It's not along either one of our axes. It's not in either of our negative or positive directions. This is going to have a magnitude of some number that will be a positive number, and the direction of this force can only be described as down, straight toward the ground, because our frame of reference doesn't have an axis in that direction. So that means we don't want to use this force. It's going to be too hard to use it mathematically. Instead, what we want to do with this force is we want to break it into two pieces. One of those pieces will be in the direction of our y-axis, like this. And one of those pieces will be in the direction of our x-axis, like this. Now, I showed you how to do this before. For an object on a ramp, it's pretty standard that we're going to have some information about the angle of the ramp. That's going to be the same as this angle right here, which means the part of this gravitational force that's in the direction of the ramp will have a magnitude of mg times the sine of that angle. And the part of this gravitational force that's perpendicular to the surface will have a magnitude of mg times the cosine of that angle. That is going to be pretty consistent. Other times, maybe a little bit less obvious whether you're using sine or cosine, but you'll know angles and you'll have um, 
you have numbers, and so you could use the vector solver, right? So um, I know that not all of you have the trigonometry to do this for every situation. Everyone needs to be able to do it for an object sitting on a ramp or a, s a sloped surface. Everybody needs to be able to pull this out of the hat, but you won't necessarily, like if I tell you there's like a rope hanging down from a, from a clock and the, the, the hour hand is you know, pointing to two or something like that, you're not gonna have to do the trigonometry for that because I understand that um, not all of you have that training. Okay? So there's my free body diagram. I've got my forces broken into components as necessary and now we're gonna pretend like this downward blue force doesn't even exist. Is there, but it's equivalent mathematically to this down into the left force added to this down into the right force. These two imaginary forces, they're not real, are in the right direction, right? One is aligned with our y-axis, one is aligned with our x-axis. We're gonna use these in place of this, okay? The next step is to apply Newton's second law. So what does that look like? Well, we've got two dimensions that we're working with here. So we're going to uh, apply Newton's second law in each dimension, one at a time. Let's start with the x dimension. So the sum of the forces on this object along this axis right here will be equal to that object's mass times its acceleration along that axis. What are the forces? We have one force, it's not a real force, in the positive direction, mg sine theta. Sum of forces means we add them together. So one of the forces that I'm gonna be adding is mg sine theta. That is the parallel part of the gravitational force. I'm gonna add any other forces in that dimension. My other force along the x-axis is the force of friction. That's in my negative direction. So I'm gonna put a negative sign in front of that force. And my convention for this class for forces is gonna be whenever possible, the variable for a force is gonna stand for a positive number. Which means if we know the direction of a force, if it's in the negative direction, we're gonna put the negative sign in front of the variable. If we were to do algebra here, and solve for the force of friction, we're always going to get that the force of friction is equal to a positive number. If we want to know the direction, we look at the free body diagram. It's in the negative direction. We're going to use the opposite convention for our accelerations. We don't know the direction of this acceleration. Depending on the various forces involved, this skier might be slowing down, in which case the acceleration is in the negative direction. The skier might be speeding up, in which case the acceleration is in the positive direction, or might be moving at a constant velocity, in which case the acceleration is zero. We don't know. So rather than put a sign in front of our acceleration variable, we're going to let this variable stand for any, any real number. This could be positive, could be negative, it could be zero. Forces, it's different. Our forces are always going to be positive. If we know that a force is in the negative direction, we'll put a negative sign in front of the variable, okay? And that convention is gonna sort out a lot of the difficulty that you have mathematically. You just have to get used to it, okay? So we've just set up our Newton's um, second law in one of our dimensions. We have a variable here, force of friction,